Do you want to win a free cookbook? Do you want to know how to use your Instapot? Have you been terrified? Is it still in a box on the shelf and you don't know what to do with it? Well, you are in the right place. Hi, y'all. My name is Virginia Willis and welcome to Cookbooks with Virginia. This is a weekly show celebrating the cookbooks. I love cookbooks. I love collecting cookbooks and some of my best friends are cookbook authors. And this show is honestly this selfish little way for me to get to talk to my friends every week. But what's so great is that you get to meet them too. You get to ask live questions. You're going to learn a great recipe today. So even if you aren't catching this live, you're going to want to watch. And I am thrilled to pieces today. I have on Paula Scheuer, my friend and colleague, and she has written this great book, The Instapot Kosher Cookbook. And if you're not Jewish and you're not kosher, then guess what? I want you to stick around because this food looks amazing. I'm so familiar with Paula's recipes and I just think she's one of the hardest working ladies in the business. So um, let's bring her on. Oh my gosh, lots of thanks are here already. So thank you so much. Hey, Paula, good morning. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Virginia. It is so great to be with you virtually, although I think we would have so much fun if we were in the same place cooking together. I know. I can't wait for all the people that I haven't seen in so long to like to get together and like and cook with. We've already got some folks. So Indigo East is here and Rob Lawrence is here and Beverly is here. Beverly, I'm so sorry about the loss of your cousin this week. We are definitely still in it with um with COVID. So thank you for showing up. So so Paula, this book is it's it's awesome, y'all. This the Instapot Kosher Cookbook. So tell me a little bit about it. Tell me um so you're the kosher oh, let me start here. You're you're known as the kosher baker. Mm -hmm. You're baking books are phenomenal. You've been a guest on the show before. I, I, I love your baking books. How did you get from the baking oven to the Instapot? Well, like obviously my family couldn't like live off of chocolate babka for dinner like every single night, right? Well, probably water so, <laughs> although, you know, my four children might say, well, mom, we are, now that I've turned babka into pizza babka, I guess, you know, you could have babka for dinner. It's on yeah. the website. It's very cool. But I, you know, so I wrote, um, I trained in France. I'm a pastry chef. I love desserts. I still love making desserts. But after two dessert books, my publisher asked me to write a Passover cookbook. And so mm -hmm. that was my transition into food. What I did for that book, I took all the recipes that were in my head that I made for my family all wow. the time and just put them on paper as a gift to my children. Like, here's everything you love. But of course, I shared it with the world, too. And then after that, I kind of had to come out with like my healthy cookbook. Yep. Because if you're creating dessert recipes all the time, and the one we talked about last time, like the holiday kosher oh, baker, right? I, we photographed 80 desserts over four days. So, like, when you have so many desserts around, you have to develop a style of cooking mm -hmm. so that you can stay healthy. Wow. So, I say that like you need this healthy book so you always have room for dessert, but yeah. it's about balance. So that's kind of how I moved into food. And, and now with the Instant Pot, and it was kind of funny how it happened that I even wrote this book because I avoided the Instant Pot for the longest time. So people who are kosher, we, we don't mix milk and meat together. And mm -hmm. what that means is like, not just that we won't have like a dairy dessert at a meat meal, but we don't cook milk and meat in the same pot. And we have completely separate sets of pots and pans, utensils, baking pans, blenders, designated for our milk and designated for meat. So my kitchen is so jam packed. So somebody saying to me, oh, Paula, we want Instapot recipes. I'm thinking, really, where am I putting this thing? But you no, know, I have to tell you, let me just ask you though, because I think that that's what you said about you were a late comer to Instapot. It has caught the world on fire, right? Mm -hmm. There are people that like, I don't have room for this thing. Where am I going to put it kosher or not? And, right. um, and there's always this like, kind of fear factor, not like not real fear, like something's going to happen because it's a very safe appliance. But oh, it's like, hundred. It's very safe. But the thing yeah. what's great about it for people who I didn't wasn't thinking about this, like for my children in their 20s who live in small kitchens in their apartments or their off campus, you right. know, small apartments, this replaces so many different pots. So yeah. you can make rice in it, you can make soup in it. I never make soup on the stovetop anymore. It comes out richer, deeper flavored and faster in the Instant Pot. So you know, when I finally tried it out, I made um, split pea soup and the split peas, you know, that takes forever to get them right. creamy, were creamy really fast. I made short ribs, I made rice and I was hooked. And then somebody told me about a Facebook group called the Instant Pot 
the kosher instant pot facebook group right and back in you know fall of 2018 they had 8700 members and i thought wow so i start going through the feed to just get ideas for recipes and i saw people getting angry because others would post recipes that weren't entirely kosher like it would be a, a meat dish but then there was cream in it and they had to replace it with something else so i thought hmm, i write cookbooks i should write this group a cookbook so i sat down and wrote a book proposal virginia i had used it three times wrote down you know four pages on why the jewish community needs this book why it's perfect for all of our favorites whether you're ashkenazi Sephardi, you know eastern european or north african in origin and kind of came up with a bunch of recipe ideas and this facebook group now has fourteen thousand seven hundred oh members so i joke that sometimes you have to fake it until you make it like i wasn't an expert i went from zero to writing a cookbook within months. So all of you who say it's in the garage or I haven't taken it out, like I'm telling you, it's so much easier. And I, what I did in the book is that every recipe tells you what buttons to push. So you don't have to go to the instructions and you don't have to go to the yep. beginning of the book. It's like, it tells you prep time, time to pressure, cook time so that you can plan it out. And I, oh my God. Wanting, oh my God, my I've been wanting these so bad forever. Oh my grandma's stuffed cabbage. Oh my gosh. I want those so bad. I might, I'm going to make that. Those are really good. They definitely are time consuming, but they're, it, they're fabulous. They're really they're great. So and worth it. The oh, trick hummus. about. I bet hummus in the Instapot is amazing. Oh, I, I, right before we came on, I thought I need a dip for my challah tonight. So I think I'm going to make that after the, we finish because I want something, you know, I love having hummus around. This recipe makes a lot. So I think I'm just going to make the half recipe. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I, can I tell a story about the sweet, they were, they're Swedish meatballs, but they're basically made out of like Heinz chili sauce and great jam. Now right. my father who didn't really cook anything, uh -huh. uh, he used to make homemade grape jelly out of grapes. We grew in our backyard two blocks from the beach, like who grows grapes in a beach town, but he did, and he made jelly out of them. So we used to make the, the sauce for the meatballs is with the, his jelly and, and the chili sauce. Um, and dad's gone, but I still have two jars that I'm kind of like resisting the urge to use. So I think I'll uh, wait till we have a, yeah, a big okay. family celebration. Maybe next time my brothers are here and we can all do it together, I will make them the meatballs with That's the right cool. jelly. Now that is okay. so funny that I love that story. I love that um, you say that he, it's like chili sauce and grape jelly, but he made homemade grape jelly. That's like a whole other level of Martha's. <laughs> I know, it's so like, funny. I always can't drive. Everything <gasps> bagel, chicken wings, you're a beast woman. That's so ridiculous. what's so great about those is that, okay, so I have some accessories here, but I'm gonna show you this quickly. Hold on. So your instant pot comes with a rack. Okay. So you put right. the rack in the, in the pot, in the inner pot, you put water underneath and then you pile the, the chicken wings on top and they cook really, really quickly, five minutes, eight minutes, something like that. And then you dump them on a baking pan. You, I use jarred barbecue sauce. Don't always do everything homemade. Barbecue sauce is one of those things that sometimes it's just so easy. Everything bagel spice. And then I broil them five minutes each side. So the outside is crunchy and the inside is so moist because it's been boiled. They've been boiled first. Oh my gosh. My, I, my stomach just grumbled. Hopefully the mic didn't. I know. And now that. you're making me want to make those today, but I think oh I, have a different, I have a different chicken for tonight. I'm checking my Instagram. The, 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 I love that. The Blanc and Bolognese. So, okay. So for anyone that's watching or is going to watch this later and you thought kosher food, what's that? Or I don't know what Jewish food is or whatever. You know spaghetti bolognese, you know hummus now for sure. You know but what's cool about the spaghetti recipe, Virginia, is that you're cooking up the sauce, which is made out of ground beef and kind of short rib. We call it flanken. It's a Yiddish word for this kind of short ribs with the right, small right, bones. Right. So you cut it up in chunks and you make a sauce. Then you take your spaghetti, rinse it underwater, break it in half, drop it around jar of sauce, jar of water, close the top, the spaghetti and the sauce cook at the same time. So when you're done, you have one thing to wash and you have your whole meal done. So like Jewish and Jewish people basically are eating like American international trendy food kind of all week long, like just the same as everybody else. It's really only on Shabbat and holidays that we're gonna eat. Like we wanna get, have our chicken soup and our gefilte fish and our stuffed cabbage and our oh. traditional foods. 
but there's so many foods, so many like Jewish foods that are like comfort foods. Like, you know, um, oh. the, uh, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot brisket, like, oh my God, like yummy, yummy, yum. This looks amazing. Marrakesh beef tagine with pruned mm -hmm. nuts. I know. So the sweet spot of the Instant Pot really is like comfort food, like soups and stews. And I think one of the beauty, the beauties of Instant Pot cooking right now is that it makes the kind of food that you can share. You know, I'm going to, I'm making all this soup. You know, I'm going to put some in a container and bring it to one of my friends because somebody needs comfort. Somebody needs to, maybe somebody actually has something to celebrate or, or some kind of tragedy. There's just so much around us right now. And I feel like mm -hmm. you can use this device to like soothe people during a time when they really need it. No, it's so true. And I do love, so I was the same with you. Like I was really slow to the Instapot. I love my Luke Crusades, you know, I love those heavy pots and the long, slow simmer. And finally I was like, okay, as a culinary professional, I need to understand what this is about. Like if nothing else, I need to understand what this is about. And I was, my mind was a little blown. Right. Like I, I still don't use it all the time. Like I know people that like cook basically everything in it. I mm -hmm. don't do that, but um, I love what you have. You have, you have so much instruction in the beginning. You've got like the how you literally have using your Instapot. Like you have the how to guide on like the accessories and, and how to use oh, it. Yeah. And like I have like, this is really cool. It's a oh, steamer so with yeah. feet. So you like, it has feet. So like you can, you put your water at the bottom, you put mm -hmm. in, you could steam potatoes. Like I'll cut up potatoes in cubes and I'll steam them. And then I'll get out my cast iron pan, heat that up and then throw them in afterwards so that they get really crispy. Right. So you can cook things in that. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff. This is like really cute. I have um, a mini bun pan. I make sponge cake. It is. Oh my god! Um, and I have a spring form pan. Okay, so just this week alone, I made flourless chocolate cake in it. That was water at the bottom. This was on the rack, and I have in my fridge right now a flan that I'm going to unmold today. That I made in a Zoom class last night. Um, you know, you were talking about you know the instructions at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. like Virginia. I really see myself as a teacher at heart, and the pandemic has made me realize how much so because I started teaching Zoom cooking classes like a year ago, March. I have taught 156 Zoom cooking classes in the last like 13 months with no end in sight. I'm booking virtual events for December of this year, which is so crazy to me. That's so awesome. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you right there and tell everybody, y'all, if you wanna know more about Paula, go to her website, thecoacherbaker.com. She is truly, um, she's truly one of the hardest working women that I know. I want you to back up just a minute. You told me this really wonderful story when we were talking about getting ready because you have a whole other life before you went to like pastry school and, mm -hmm. dance and all that kind of stuff. So give us a short snippet. And then I want people to make sure that if you want to hire Paula for an on for a virtual cooking class, you need to do it because she is amazing. But tell us a little bit about your former life. Thanks so much. Okay, so I basically went to college to become a doctor, but I ended up in law school after an uh, accident at the chemistry lab. Ooh. And um, so I went to law school and graduated practice law in Washington, D.C. And then my husband was working for oh, the what? U.S. government. <laughs> what? Yeah. So what? then we... So we went, um, the government sent us to Geneva, Switzerland to for him to work in a, mm -hmm. as a diplomat for four years. I had a legal job in Geneva, but after I had my daughter, my boss became difficult. So I left and thought, hey, I'm in Europe. I'm going to go to cooking school in Paris just for fun, not planning a new career. Took my baby daughter with me to Paris. She ended up in the 95th percentile for weight because every morning I would check out other pastry shops. And then every evening I'd come back to my friend's apartment with like 10 cake boxes. I'm telling you, she didn't walk until her brother was almost born. She was, you know, now she's like supermodel, gorgeous, skinny girl, but like she was just a butterball turkey. And, um, and so I came back. <laughs> so cute, right? We always, we, joke, we always joke about her fat baby Emily pictures, but she kind of owns it, so it's fine. So, um, so then I came back to Geneva, people in the Jewish community there asked me to bake for them. And then friends in the diplomatic community asked me to cater for them. So now I have a catering business 
And then I taught a cooking class as a fundraiser in French. That was kind of more comedy than instruction, but a good experience. <laughs> So um, we call it that. <laughs> right, right, right. So I came oh, back to the US. I had two kids in tow, Emily and Sam, started teaching cooking classes right here in this kitchen. And then a well known cookbook author asked me to edit two of her cookbooks. And I thought halfway through that process, hey, I could write my own cookbook. But then it took five years for me to get a publisher to publish my book. Yeah. Like JK Rowling, like everybody said no. They said there was no market for kosher baking cookbooks. So I finally got, yes. right, right. So then I, I proved them wrong. Brandeis University Press did my first book. Then I got an agent and a bigger publisher. And you know now I'm on my fifth book with cooking classes I've done in China and all over the United States. And um, I don't know, been on TV like 47 times. Just I've been yeah, really I, blessed. I have so much respect for you. And I get notes all the time, y'all, about, oh my God, Virginia, you work all the time. Or you're the hardest working woman I know, or all these like really wonderful compliments and all this kind of stuff. And I told Paula yesterday, I'm like, Paula, the only person I think that works more or more harder or harder than I do is you. I just can't even believe that you taught 156 cooking virtual cooking just classes crazy. here. But oh I really God. believe that like nobody's like I really and I've always believed this like nobody's handing you anything in life like you I, nothing has ever been easy for me. There's no like, oh, I had one cookbook and I sold 50,000 copies or I got my own. Sh There's none right. of that. It's like, you know, I always describe it as, you know, people say you build a business brick by brick, but I feel like there's so many pebbles first, like little right. um, achievements that pile up. And occasionally you'll get a brick, you'll get a book deal, you'll I'll get on a national TV show, but then I go back to getting some pebbles. But at some point I was able to stand on the top of this heap and say, hey, well, look where I am. I think that is such a beautiful you know? analogy. I love that so much because because life, you know, there are very few people that get to put brick, 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 right? And and uh and it really life is like a series of pebbles and it's a journey. You know, and, right. and um, even if you get to the top of the heap, like you still may go back to getting pebbles and that's OK. Oh. I just feel like you just have to like trust yourself that like this is what you're meant to do and just work really hard. I just think that the world really does reward really hard work because yeah. I just don't think I just don't think anything anything is easy and everything has just gotten so much harder in the last year for yeah. so many people in in a, in a myriad of ways and you right. just have to like you know my healthy book was written um my publisher came to me about five weeks after my mother died and said would you write a healthy book and i thought i'm on the sofa every night with like my best friends ben and jerry's <laughs> thinking like i don't want to do anything and then I thought, all right, I have yeah. to get off the sofa. And I wrote this book and I realized like just having a project that made me feel hopeful, that had me moving forward towards some light and some positive, even in the smallest way, healed me. So I like, oh, and food is so healing. And I think, and that is so important. And I love the way that you just keep inventing and reinventing. But I will say this, and I'm saying this for everyone that's watching, y'all. Her recipes are so well written and they're tested, right? They're tested and, and they're tested again. And Paula has mm -hmm. recipe testers all over the world that she sends her recipes to so that home cooks without any training will test her recipes and get back to her and report and say, do this, do that, or this is, I had trouble with this, or I had trouble with that, or, you exactly. know. Exactly. And and um you know I we we were uh, rejoicing yesterday cookbook authors because um, I always I always tease people right Paula it's like I hate to be the one to tell you but you just can't believe everything that you read on the internet I like my family was doing um, brunches <laughs> themed brunches when everybody was home last year my kids right. are between twenty one and twenty four and we did we used the hashtag brunch like a shoyer you can that. look it up on my at kosher baker Instagram from last year. But we and my daughter, Emily Scheuer, has has like all the pictures and a highlight. So we would do like Southern American, British high tea, Swiss food, Indian food, Japanese food, Cuban every week. And we would get recipes online. And I we found a lot of the recipes had to be, you know, worked around. They, were, they weren't perfect. And I feel like people just put stuff online. So I always feel like people should just find authors that they trust and know that their recipes are reliable because like no. my recipes are tested so many times before they get out. That doesn't mean that I don't find like a tiny mistake every once in a while in something. Yeah. And I'm happy for somebody to point it out to me um, because 
it's okay. I want to, I want to learn as well. And I, you know, I can fix it yeah, in the next yeah, edition yeah, of the book, you know, let's check and see who's here. So we've got, um, Cheryl Stewart is here. Carrie Bogman. Hey, Carrie, how's it going? Um, uh, Tracy is here. Gil Gelton is here. Anita Tareen is here. Oh my gosh. Um, that's so great. Well, if anyone has any questions, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that would be great if anyone can ask. Rob Lawrence is here. And I want to make sure that um, if anyone wants to know any more about Paula, that you guys go, y'all go to the kosherbaker.com. And the best part is, is that you can um, also win a copy of this book and all these delicious recipes. So it's um, 100 recipes to nourish body and soul. And once again, if you're not kosher, it's okay, right? It's no, it's no, it's still delicious food. Paula explained the, the difference with kosher before. And I think the thing to consider is that um, one of the things that I thought was so exciting that you told me yesterday, Paula, is the dairy free aspect. So if someone Absolutely. wants to reduce their dairy, kosher mm -hmm. is the way to go. Right. And what I, I try to do in like most of my books, like the recipes are going to tell you at the top of the book, if it's gluten free, if it could be made for Passover, um, we have a word called PARV, P-A-R-V-E, which yep. means dairy free. And yep. we, I do a ton of dairy free baking. My first cookbook, The Kosher Baker, was all dairy free, but I always have a mix. But I just, I want every everybody, no matter what diet they're on, to find something that they like. Yeah, the orange chicken from the cover, mm -hmm. that's great. Chicken yeah, is very yummy. moist in the Instant Pot. Um, for me, it was fun to learn how to bake in it. I do salads in the Instant Pot. I cook up carrots and then I make a Moroccan carrot salad. I make a Turkish eggplant salad and then I chill it. I make beet tahina. Um, I take frozen boneless chicken breasts, put Tech them frozen, chili. frozen, right? And put them on the rack on top of water. Uh -huh. I cook those and then I can shred those in a salad and I have a Japanese ginger and carrot dressing to put on top. So you can put frozen chicken and meat into the Instant Pot. It just takes a drop longer. I'm checking on my pot here because in a few minutes. Um, oh, let me explain the recipe that I have here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm all excited about your other things. So, yes. Yeah, so, y'all, um, Paula uh, is making, you're going to tell us what you're making and mm -hmm. tell us what's in it. And then I, you sent me the recipe and I'll post the recipe. Absolutely. On the pages. So I'm making like a classic mushroom barley soup and what's, what I love about having mushroom barley soup, it reminds me of the Moosewood cookbook, which was like my first cookbook that I had on my own back in my 20s. And um, and I always loved those recipes, but the, my mushroom barley is, you know, kind of inspired by that by that recipe. So I did, I sauteed onions in some oil and the saute function is so fabulous in the Instant Pot. I'm gonna talk about that again in a second. Then I sauteed shiitake mushrooms, white mushrooms, and I changed the recipe a little bit. I had uh -huh. a little bit of meat left over because I did a, a live the other day on Instagram and I made a Moroccan harira soup, which people are eating all around the world now because it's a traditional soup to eat at the end of the day during Ramadan. Why? Um, and Jewish Moroccans eat it after Yom Kippur. So it's a really nice, beautiful connection. And so I had this meat left over. I added the meat as well. I added some vegetable stock and salt and pepper and my barley, and it cooks for about 18 minutes. Once it's done cooking, the device immediately goes to warm. So mine's been on warm for five minutes and in about usually around 10 minutes, but I'll probably do it before. I'm gonna add in chopped dill and soy sauce. Now adding soy sauce to a soup at the end like really pops the flavor. Yeah. And um, and you could use lemon juice or lime juice the same way, even vinegar, but the soy sauce is great. And if you wanted a soy free option, you could use like red wine or something like that too. But the, and, the, the um, soy sauce has got that umami and you've already got the umami with the beef and you've already got the umami with the mushrooms. So you've got this exactly. like triple, triple of umami. So I love those tips, but gosh, beef and barley soup in 18 minutes, Right. I mean, normally, that would be a really oh, an easily hour like process. easily hour plus. I have my family's like signature recipe or beef and barley soup in the in the book, which has all these other vegetables. But I've never put meat into a mushroom barley soup, so I'm kind of excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, I just had this meat sitting in the fridge. You know, I think so many of us have gotten 
so good over the last year of like using the stems of our ingredients. We, I, in our family, we zest the citrus before we juice it to get multiple uses. And I just didn't really want to just do it. I had a one strip of meat. Like, what am I going to do with that? I threw it in my soup. So now it becomes okay. part of my stock. So yeah, I, like I think so. And it's real. I do agree with you so much about like a food waste. I've become much more cognizant. I mean, I was very, as a culinary professional, I was very cognizant before but I, mm -hmm. I feel like I turned up the volume on that. Like I really- Oh, but we started composting yeah. also. And um, and now I'm growing herbs outside. And when we planted the herbs last week, I, we put compost in it. My my husband always calls it the, the most expensive compost in the world <laughs> because I buy so many ingredients and, you know, cause I'm doing Zoom classes almost every day. It's really, it's really been extraordinary. Um, I mentioned before about the saute function on the Instant Pot, which yeah. is like one of the best features. And and I, I like to joke that these days we all feel like a carrot thrown into the Instant Pot. So like, imagine you're a carrot, you're thrown into hot oil, you've got the shock of the heat, but you look around, you see other vegetables, you adjust to the heat, but then more ingredients and, and liquid comes in and you're flooded, right? And oh, then God. somebody locks you in. Ah! And the pressure builds up and builds up and finally, like it's done cooking, the, the pressure comes down, the lid is removed and you can plot your escape. So I feel like during COVID at its best, we're on the warm setting, right? We're adjusting to this reality. Sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's easier, but we're uncomfortable all the time. And at its worst, we're being fully pressure cooked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love you. That is so great. It has been, but I have to tell you, comfort food is soared, right? Like, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, and it's kind of interesting. Like I know there were a lot, uh, there was a snow this past week in New England. Mm -hmm. like late April snow. Um, it was, I think, 39 degrees one night this week in Atlanta. It's already It was 35 yesterday in the morning. I, I went out, I got my hat yeah. and my scarf to go outside yesterday. It was yeah, great. No, I mean, uh, and um, I mean, we've had, we've had in the, in the mid eighties already in mm -hmm. Atlanta, and it was still like in the thirties. So, I mean, crazy weather. So it's definitely still super stew weekend. Like, oh. like, yummy, brazy things. Virginia, my mother made soup 52 weeks a year. If, and I didn't even have air conditioning where I grew up in Long Island. My mother made soup for Friday night dinner. It didn't matter what the weather was. Like soup for, you know, so I always feel like I have to have soup for Friday night dinner. It's yeah. so great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly turn this for a second so you guys can like see this here. What's going on? Yeah, so here it's nine minutes. And it's like, we're almost done. I'm just gonna rush this. I'm literally just turning the lever here to release the remaining pressure. Okay. So I can show you guys the soup. And then I have here like two tablespoons of uh, soy sauce and just chopped dill. If I didn't have dill, I could use any other herb that I want. Um, and so the steam is coming out of it here. Let me see if I have something fun to show you guys. My, my kids bought, my adult kids bought me this as a oh, gift. Oh, that's so cute. It's supposed to look like me. Oh, okay. So, ha, huh, I'm gonna show you guys something because yeah, this is why I usually, okay. So I'm doing something called intermittent release because the barley, because it's very starchy. So you kind of do this slow, like that. You kind of turn it on and off so it doesn't spat out like it's doing. Yeah. Anyway, but I'm just gonna let the let this come out. I'll clean it up later, and then I'm gonna add in my other ingredients, and I'll show you what the soup looks like. And using both shiitake and regular mushrooms in a recipe, you get like different textures, and it's so yeah. nice to have the barley texture too. So I will show you it in a, in a second. I'm just waiting for the Yay, to finish the seeds to come out. It's so good. And the other you know, the great thing about this is that, you know, like I, like we were talking before. So I tell you what, while we're waiting on that, why don't I start asking you on um, the five questions that I started asking everybody? Absolutely. I've really, um, I've really been enjoying um, finding out. So, okay. So um, the first question is, other than your own, what is one of the last cookbooks that you read or looked at or you were thumbing through? Oh gosh, I'm always thumbing through cookbooks. I was reading The Flavor Equation recently um, by Nick Sharma just to see what I could learn yep. about kind of building up flavor. So that yep. one, that was really kind of cool. Um, and also Jay Cohen's Jewish. I had some fun with that book. Somebody else's twist on Jewish Jewish recipes. That's so cool. I love. I haven't. I haven't um, dove into Nick's uh, book completely yet, but I think that um, I love. I think that what you're talking about is so right. I love learning just a little bit of science, right? Like what we were talking about with the soy mm -hmm. sauce, the soup, the building. Right, exactly. 
just a little bit of little bit of science can really ex make help make flavors explode. Okay, yep. what other than an Instapot? What is your most indispensable cooking tool? So many, but I, honestly, I mean, I would say I love my electric juicer because I use a lot of citrus. But like my my good old Cuisinart food processor, like I use it. And no, actually, hand blender, hand blender has to be my I favorite thing in the world. Oh my god, I have like dairy one, meat one, Passover. Just like love my hand blenders. Oh look, okay, Scott. I've been in the kitchen all morning and late to this party. I need all the IP help in the world. We'll start, <laughs> start over, but I tell you what. Um, you're gonna, I know you're going to get in there and try to win. Scott's a great, has his own cookbook, great cookbook author, great chef. Um, and I think that's interesting, Scott. Some of us, some of the professionals, right? Mm -hmm. Late to the party. He's like, why do I need yep. one more gadget? I just have a I was late to the party yeah. too, Scott. You can message me anytime. I can FaceTime with you. Happy to walk you through it oh, at any time. That's so kind. That's so kind. Okay. Um, of the five flavors, sour, salty, bitter, sweet, and savory. Slash umami of those five flavors, mm -hmm. like what's your go to? What is a flavor you cannot it's live always with? gonna be salt? So, but that's so interesting. You're it's always gonna be salt. I'm a baker, like, oh, she's gonna say sweet, yeah. Like, basically, what I'm taking to a desert island is like fried chicken and potato chips, like <laughs> that's it. I just even last I had flourless chocolate cake last night yesterday after I finished a Zoom class that I did and I had some of the flourless chocolate cake and I'm like no I need something else and I found some toasted nuts that I threw on salad the other day so I went and ate the nuts because I needed to eat something that wasn't sweet. Oh my god I cannot wait to make the chocolate cake. I haven't done I will tell you this I have not done any baking in an Instapot or not baking, whatever. It, it bakes the kinds of things that you would bake in a water bath. The cheesecake right. is so creamy, pot de creme, lava cakes, like all that stuff comes out so good in the Instant Pot. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yes. I'm waiting for, oh, I, can, yeah. ah, I finally can take my lid off. Great, all right, I'm just gonna oh, turn this over here. Before, yeah, as I say, turn it. Go ahead, I'm you. listening. Oh, you took it off. I was gonna t let people show, but that's okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show it in a second, but I'm just adding my. And usually, once I add the soy sauce and the dill, I'm gonna let it sit for another five minutes on, on warm. But I just want everybody to see. In fact, I think I'm just gonna really bring this over here. Okay, cool. So you can kind of see what it looks like. I will. So let, me, let me just stop you for a second. So this is the yep. deal, y'all. Um, the the Instapot is essentially a pressure cooker, but it's not the scary pressure cooker from you know our grandmother time yep and it's a very safe you appliance see that? it's kind of hard to yeah. see let me see if i tilt it down a little bit more you can kind of there we go there we go you can kind of see oh it my God, I want it's going to get thicker because it has barley and you know that barley is just going to it's really going to thicken up and this still needs to sit on warm for like another five minutes or so right but it's got the meat is all it's got meat chunks in it i got the barley and the barley isn't crazy crazy soft so like I'm very excited to, uh, I'll probably end up eating this for lunch because I have so much of it. So I'm just letting the lid sit and it's on warm, which means that like, it's still going to keep counting up from the time that right, um, right, right. it's been counting up warm. You know, I did 10 minutes. Now it's at 14. I'm just going to let it sit to about 20 and then it'll be ready to eat and taste. And the other thing is if you ever cook something in the Instapot and you open it up and for whatever reason, like something isn't fully cooked, you can just close it up again and add more time and it doesn't, it'll still come out great. So know that you can, you know, make a mistake if you're converting a recipe that isn't necessarily Instant Pot right, to your Instant Pot. Right, and it's still, I do think it really, because all that flavor is trapped in there. So what I was saying is like, you, there's a, it has to build up and you go over this in the book, it has to build up and then it cooks, yep. and you release the steam. And then when you undo the lid, it's it. It's just, it's easy, you're taking a lid off, it's locked And when off. you're, when things are cooking, you can go ahead and do something else. Like you don't have to stand over the stove top. I made uh, my first barbecue brisket on the grill last week. It took oh. me about seven, eight hours. I was out there every 45 minutes checking the temperature of the grill and checking the temperature of the meat. I just love this. I throw my stuff in and I can do something else. Take a walk, call a friend. Oh, you know? I love that. I love that. Okay. Um, okay. I have another question. So, um, okay. This is, this can get a little bit more, you know, whatever, but, uh, um, what is your, one of your favorite cooking shows to watch? Like, do you have a favorite, uh, celebrity chef or a favorite cook that you like to watch on TV? You know, it's such a funny question to ask me because I spend all day long in my kitchen. So when I want to watch something on TV, I want to watch something explode. I want a murder mystery. I want some drama. So 
I, I really, um, when, like when you were on Chopped, I watched Chopped, ah. you know? Um, when my friends are on the shows, I'll watch. I've been saving the Great British Baking Show for when I'm like really ready to like dive into it. Yeah. But I, I haven't watched recently. I competed on the Food Network on Sweet Genius years ago and I used to watch all the shows obsessively. Um, I really have always liked Giada, I have to say. Yeah. There's something about, I mean, she's stunning and yet, you feel kind of at home with her. She kind of makes you feel kind of, her food is accessible and she has this wonderful warmth. So I would say she's probably one of my favorites because oh, they're so nice. I know it's like there's something different for everyone. Um, I have to say, I think that one of my favorite people to watch is always Jacques Pepin. I, oh. I cannot watch him without learning something. Like, well, something. I think about him all the time. I, you, I'm sure you were at the IACB conference where all of us were in different sessions and um, somebody had tweeted, Jacques Pepin just put an ice cube into his white wine glass. And everybody was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And um, cause he had done a session with a meal and he he wanted his his wine to be really cold. He goes, oh, I always do that. And everybody was in shock. Yeah. And, ever, and ever since then, I do that all the time. Drop an ice cube into my wine cause I want it really, really cold. And I think about Jacques. No, kill the sacred cow, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> why not? Like, you know, I mean, I, I agree. Rules can be broken and yep. you know, sometimes it takes a leader. Well, that's so cool to know about Giada. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah. right, my, la my last question is, um, um, what is one of your favorite food memories? Uh, you know, I, you know, I talk about food memories all the time, but, you know, I used to sit in my grandmother's kitchen and watch her measure cake ingredients with her hand. So she had this pink and uh, yellow kitchen in Brooklyn and I would sit there and and watch her cook. She was a great baker. My mother only baked once a year with mixes on Passover. So homemade desserts was such a big deal and I loved watching her cook. The crazy thing is that 35 years after I was that, you know, 10 year old teaching, I mean, sitting in the kitchen with my grandmother, I ended up going back into that same kitchen because it was owned by a synagogue and the synagogue unbeknownst to them contacted me to do a cooking demo in their rabbi's house. When I called them up and said, oh. hey, am I doing it at this particular address? They said, how do you know our rabbi's house home address? And I said that that was my grandparents' house. So I did a cooking demo for their community in the same kitchen where I learned to bake from my grandmother. And she was already gone having oh. lived to age 98 on a diet of sponge cake and Sanka. And- um, Oh my God, you're gonna, that, okay, I'm not gonna cry. It, you just said sponge It cake. was like amazing to go back there and to think I'd be really nervous because she was gone. I thought I would be like sad, but I felt so at peace because I knew there. that's what I was meant to be doing. My cookbook was finally out. My, my, my mother, my aunt, my daughter were all there with me. And oh, um, it was yeah. such a tribute to her memory. And, you know, just like, in normal times, we'd have like old and young people at the table. I tell people to bring your old and young recipes to the table. Pick something that tells your own food story, whether a memory when you were younger or your first apartment in college or, right. you know, something you fed your kids, like whenever you got divorced, like what used to make for yourself that tells your story and then take a new recipe for me from Virginia, something you've never made before and create new food memories at the same time and, and tell oh, the stories oh. of like why you're making the food you're making. You're just, I just, I love you. I adore you. I just think that you're so amazing. Oh, it's so I'm mutual. a fan and I just love your philosophy. I love your work ethic, the pebble story that you told us earlier. I am so grateful for you um, bringing your book on Cookbooks with Virginia today. Um, Y'all, please make sure to go to the Instagram. So Paula, thank you so much for coming oh. on with your book today. Oh, Virginia, this was so great. And I'm happy to talk to your community. Hopefully some of mine are there too. Yes. Anybody can ask me questions anytime. I'm very accessible, whether it's through Facebook or at Kosher Baker and Instagram. Like uh, in the olden days, people would email me and I would respond to every cooking question. So yeah, I, no, I, I want to be so, successful. You can, people can get a copy of your book at all, of course, at the big stores and the online stuff. But y'all, if you want to get a signed copy of your book, go to kosherbaker.com and Paula will, um, yep. we're, we're going to support the local independent bookstore, yes. that's Paula Scheuer, which is this, which is a really exactly like business. small bookstores, or you can message me through the website and I'm, I ship books out. So, um, and I give a 10% of all my book sales to, to uh, food insecure organizations. Uh, so if you buy a book from me, you're paying it forward also. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Paula. You enjoy your your mushroom soup. Thank you so much for making oh, I'm so excited today. about the soup. Thank you for inspiring me to make a soup. And um, I hope everybody has a delicious weekend. 
Awesome. Cool, honey. Thank you so much. We'll talk All right. To thank you. Soon, you. Okay? Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, no, wrong way. <laughs> I did the wrong thing. <laughs> there we go. Hey, y'all, thank you so much for watching today. Oh, my guys, isn't she just amazing? I'm such a huge fan. I want you to, um, I want you to um, make sure to go to my Instagram feed, look for the cover of this book. Please enter to win and share this. Share this with your friends. You can copy the link in the top right hand corner and put it on Facebook. Um, it's crazy, but this is the world that we live in and social media means a lot. Paul has worked her butt off on this book and I'd love to get the word out. And um, if you have an idea, if you have um, if you have a cookbook or you have an idea of some questions or something like that, um, just let me know. So I want to thank everybody so much for watching and um, uh, bon appetit, y'all. I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye bye.